Okay. I think this is on. It's not for you guys. It's for Zoom. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to present Isaac. And, you know, I really got to spend a lot of time in the field with Isaac. And for some of you guys came out and helped us. There's many, many uh, folks who came out and helped us in the field here in the room right now. And sometimes you get to see Isaac looking like this, but more often this is what you see of Isaac in the field. And Isaac knows this is one of my favorite pictures of him. And so I like to think about, you know, where, where did Isaac come from? Isaac is going to talk to you a lot about connections between the inner title and the subtitle. You know, Isaac started at the University of Illinois, and then he, you know, dispersed to UBC. And instead of little sea urchins, they're just little cheese heads <laughs> moving across. And after a dispersal period of about four to five years, he found his way to Moss Landing and CSU in Monterey Bay. During that time, he maybe made a few forays into the dark side with some charismatic <laughs> megafauna. But he came to UBC, saw all the glory of the beautifulness of Vancouver and Vancouver Island. The glory of man buns, too. The glory of man buns, yes. And settled on algae. You know, some people might have been swept up by the forest, the trees, the whales, all the things, but he focused on algae largely driven probably by great mentors like Bridget Clarkson and Patrick Martone. As an undergrad working, he worked with Patrick Martone and worked on a study looking at uh, nutritional value of crustose coral, of, uh, articulated coral and algae. And he managed to publish this, uh, which is a huge accomplishment uh, for an undergraduate study. But then he realized why study algae when you can study the things that eat the algae. You can be, you know, you don't need to be charismatic megafauna, but you can be slightly above the bottom of the food chain. And this work, you know, Isaac is going to show you a lot of what came out of his project, but I just want to emphasize how much work this was. You know, that picture, it looks like a really nice sunset. That's a sunrise. Most of the work that we do in the inner tidal is, in, you know, is really early mornings. We're meeting when it's still dark outside, waiting for it to get just light enough that nobody will break an ankle. And we go out there and we did, you know, lots of work with lots of different students. And this work, you know, there's lots of field work associated it with lo lots of lab work as well for Isaac, including eating Thanksgiving dinner in the lab while dissecting urchins. Don't tell CSUMB lab and safety. <laughs> and all in all, Isaac has just been an amazing contributor to our lab environment, helping out with lots of other students, giving students feedback on projects, you know, contributing to lab parties, feeding my children straight sugar. <laughs> and throughout his, throughout his time at CSU and BMS Landing, he's given talks, but in addition to giving his own talks and posters at conferences, I really want to highlight how much Isaac has worked with the, the, the breadth and depth of students at CSU and B, undergraduate students that he's worked with. He's been a mentor to countless numbers of students at CSU and B, and then he's also been more formal mentors to different students. And most, you know, most graduate students present at conferences, but it's not so often that they are included as co-authors on many, many other undergraduate talks because, or talks and posters because they've meaningfully contributed both from a scientific and a mentoring perspective. And so, you know, he contributed to, you know, Rooney's, Rooney's poster, Josue, who's a community college student at Monterey Peninsula College, uh, Sophia, uh, who was a Hauling Scholar from Florida, Liz Amador, who is an undergraduate and is now a PhD student at University of Maine. Uh, Christian, who was an undergrad, now a graduate student at Moss Landing on his own. And also Megan Statton, who was a freshman when she presented a poster at Benthix. And these are just the students that he was included as an author on their talk, but I really want to emphasize how much time Isaac spent mentoring, working with students, helping them with their statistics, helping them craft their narratives. You know, before we went to Western Society of Naturalists last uh, a couple weeks ago, we had an all-day marathon of people giving practice talks and practice poster presentations, and Isaac was there for the entire time giving all the students feedback on their posters while, you know, everybody came when they could, but Isaac stayed the whole time to give everybody feedback. And as he was a graduate student, he also garnered a, a lot of accolades along the way for himself. He was, you know, the graduate student of the week, as you can see. Every, every week, he was the graduate student of the week. <laughs> Only one week was there an email sent out about it. <laughs> he also participated in the CSU-wide Grad Slam. He was the first place winner for CSUMB. And you guys are going to see his presentation of his results, which is going to be the opposite of his Grad Slam presentation. 
where he had to have just one slide and talk for just three minutes about all of his results. So luckily for you guys, you'll get to hear a lot more about him. But he, he was the first place winner for CSUMB, went on from CSUMB to complete in the CSU wide. He didn't place, but that's okay. Uh, and then he also did compete in the CSU wide student research competition where he got second place across the CSU for graduate students in his, uh, in his category. All of this, you know, going out at five o'clock in the morning, presenting at conferences, mentoring students, obviously makes somebody really very tired and exhausted. So he did take some time to take some naps, you know, like in the San, in San Diego State Library after giving his talk. And I think that Isaac, you know, Isaac is obviously gonna be successful wherever he goes after this, but one of the things that he might not have thought about is how he might have a successful career as or he's made some questionable fashion choices perhaps <laughs> over time. However, I think he could have a successful career modeling all of the latest trends of fashion ecology. <laughs> Both functional and fashionable. But as much as it might be great to have a new clothing line called, you know, Trends in Ecology and with it comes an a journal of the, you know, one issue of Trends in Ecology as well. Luckily for Isaac, he doesn't have to go that route, but he is going to disperse now. Our favorite cheese head is going to go from CSUMB and has a job starting next month at Hakai Institute in Vancouver, um, Canada. So I'm really excited for Isaac to be. It brings me lots of joy and lots of sadness to see this day come, and I'm really excited for Isaac to present his research. That's good. We're good. All right, cool. Um, thank you, Allison, for that introduction. Um, like she mentioned, I'm really excited to present my master's research to you guys. This is the culmination of about three and a half years of work um, with a lot of help. So. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to present it. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the drivers of intertidal purple sea urchin reproductive capacities and the implications that this has for kelp forest recovery. Um, so here is a map of the kelp canopy biomass along the Monterey Peninsula down into Big Sur in 1984. Um, the areas of yellow and light green are areas of high kelp canopy coverage. So you can see there's pretty much continuous kelp um, all the way from um, southern Monterey Bay down into Big Sur. And here is what the kelp canopy coverage looked like in 2019 when we started this project. Um, if you look closely, there's still patches of kelp. Um, this is on the same scale. So um, we definitely still have kelp along the coast, but there's been a dramatic decline since 1984. In fact, I think within the last nine years, we've lost about 80% of the kelp along the Monterey Peninsula. Um, so drastic declines in kelp coverage. And what we're seeing is a transition from kelp forests which offer a wide variety of ecosystem services, um, including carbon sequestration, erosion mitigation, and uh, biodiversity hotspots, to urchin barrens, which offer none of the same ecosystem services. They generally support low biodiversity communities, and they're mainly composed of purple sea urchins and coral and algae, as you can see in this picture. Um, so my study species is, of course, purple sea urchins. They are echinoderms, so related to sea stars and sea cucumbers. They have test diameters of up to seven centimeters. Um, I'll be talking about test diameter a lot. That's a basically the width of the sea urchin, um, not including the spines. So uh, up to seven centimeters big. Um, they live intertidally um, down to 160 meters depth. They're generalist herbivores, so they mainly consume al algae, although we've cracked open urchins that we've found have been eating mussel shells. So, They'll eat pretty much anything, but they prefer algae. Um, specifically, they prefer to eat kelp and other fleshy algae, especially compared to coral and algae. Coral and algae is sort of, it's made out of calcium carbonate, so it's sort of like eating chalk for the urchins. They tend to avoid eating it. Um, they're destructive grazers, so they are responsible for this transition from kelp forest to urchin barren. They graze the kelp down until there's none, none left. They're broadcast spawners, so that means that they release their gametes into the water column the gametes undergo external fertilization, and then that gives way to a planktonic larval phase that lasts one to three months before they settle and become um, juvenile sea urchins. 
So um, in conjunction with this transition that we've been seeing from kelp forests to urchin barrens, we've also, of course, seen an increase in subtitle urchin densities starting in about 2017 or 2018. Um, this is reef check data. Reef check does subtitle monitoring all along the West Coast. Um, so this is data from 2006 to 2021. Um, on the y-axis is urchin density, and as you can see, starting in about 2018, we start to see um, urchin density shoot up along the Monterey Peninsula. Um, we see densities of about, uh, you know, up to 2025 urchins per meter squared. The urchins that are living in these urchin barrens are less re reproductive. This is a study from Dolinar and Edwards, 2021. On the y-axis is reproductive capacity, um, and you can see that urchins collected from barrens are far less reproductive compared to those living in kelp forests. However, we still see these barrens persist, despite the fact that they don't have good food to eat, right? All the kelp is gone. There's lots of urchins. Uh, there's many urchins, um, and they aren't effectively reproducing. We don't often see a transition back to kelp forests. Um, one of the reasons why is coral and algae, as you can see, is abundant in sea urchins, uh, in urchin barrens. So all those pink spots in this urchin barren are, um, is coral and algae, and coral and algae acts as a settlement cue for urchins. So settlement being, um, it cues them to go from their larval stage and settle onto the, onto the seafloor and um, metamorphi me metamorphosize into um, juvenile sea urchins. Uh, the three bars on the right are urchins exposed to three different species of coral and algae. The um, blank spot on the left is urchins exposed to fresh seawater. And so as you can see, when urchins are exposed to coral and algae, they're far more likely to settle down into their juvenile form. So following that logic, it makes sense that in urchin barrens, we see a lot of small, newly recruited urchins. Um, here on the x-axis is test diameter, so how big the urchin is. On the y-axis is urchin density. The dashed line is a kelp forest, and the solid line is an urchin barren. So you can see in urchin barrens, we see far more small urchins, urchins you know, less than 20, uh, 20 millimeters test diameter. So we see lots of recruits or you know, juvenile small sea urchins coming into barrens, but it's unknown where they're coming from. The larval phase, like I mentioned, of an urchin lasts one to three months, so it's not necessary that the urchins are coming from the barren that they're living in or even nearby areas. One theory states that these urchins might be coming from the intertidal and that the intertidal is acting as sort of like a reproductive refuge for urchins living in barrens. So urchins in the intertidal are reproducing and their offspring are seeding urchin barrens, contributing to their persistence. In the intertidal, um, so this is, a, this is an aerial shot of the intertidal at Hopkins Marine Station. So in rocky intertidal areas like this, we see urchins living in areas that look sort of like kelp forest. We have lots of fleshy algae, um, lots of kelp, high algae biodiversity, and not very many urchins. We also see urchins in the intertidal living in areas that look sort of like urchin barrens with lots of urchins and lots of coral and algae and not much else. However, also in the intertidal, we see urchins living in areas that look sort of like cor uh, urchin barrens and the fact that we have lots of urchins. Um, high urchin densities, but if you look closely, you can still see there's lots of kelp and fleshy algae in these photos. So um, not necessarily the dichotomy of urchin barren or kelp forest that we see in the subtitle. Um, so this is data from our lab at CSUMB. We've been monitoring intertidal urchin densities um, since 2017. So this is very similar to the figure I showed with the reef check data, just in the intertidal. And you can see starting in 2020, we start to see a dramatic increase in um, purple urchin densities in the inner tidal. It's important to mention that this increase happened about two years later than it did in the subtitle. So the subtitle increase was first documented in 2017 in um, the Monterey Peninsula, and here we don't see it until 2020. And more importantly, um, the inner tidal increase has been far more dramatic. Um, in the subtitle, we see urchins of densities, you know, maybe getting up to 50 urchins per meter squared, but not often more than that. However, in the intertidal, we're seeing um, urchin densities of more than 200 per meter squared. So far more drastic increase in the intertidal. So since we're seeing such high densities of urchins in the intertidal, and these urchins might be seeding subtidal urchin barrens, it makes an analysis into how much, are, how much these urchins in the intertidal are reproducing really important. So this brings me to uh, my research questions. First, how does intertidal sea urchin reproductive capacity vary over season and urchin size? 
and two, how do different environmental and biological factors affect intertidal urchin reproductive capacity on and around the Monterey Peninsula? And sort of going along with that, how does this compare to what we've seen, what we see in the subtitle? So how, what do, um, how do the established drivers that we know are affecting reproduction in the subtitle compare to what we see in the intertidal? Um, to answer the first question, I visited nine sites along the Monterey Peninsula, um, spanning from just uh, south of the, uh, or the southern edge of the Monterey Bay down into Big Sur. Um, I visited these sites during summer and fall 2022, and then winter and spring 2023, so once per season. At each site, I collected 25 urchins for reproductive analysis per season, so that totals um, 900 urchins over the course of this study. To measure reproductive capacity, I, like I said, collected urchins from each site, brought them back to the lab where I weighed and measured them, and then uh, we had a big group of people or a big team of students um, dissecting urchins. We extracted their gonads and then we weighed their gonads to calculate their gonadosomatic index, or GSI. I'll refer to GSI a lot. Um, and it's basically just a proxy for reproductive capacity. So when I say GSI, I also mean reproductive capacity. Um, and it's essentially the percent of the urchin's weight that's taken up by its gonads. So we divide the gonad mass divided by the whole, um, the weight of the entire urchin to get GSI. Um, to answer the question of how does intertidal sea urchin reproductive capacity vary over season, I compared the average GSI across all four collection periods using a Kruskal-Wallace ANOVA. And to answer the question of how does reproductive capacity vary with urchin size, um, first I went back during uh, the winter 2023 period and I collected and dissected an additional 205 small urchins because I wanted to make sure that I dissected some urchins that weren't reproductive, not just um, the bigger urchins that we knew would be reproductive that we collected during the rest of the year. So I combined those 205 urchins with the 225 urchins that I collected from my normal winter collection. Um, so I had 430 urchins um, to uh, analyze for this data. They ranged in test diameter from 1.3 to 6.3 centimeters, and they ranged in weight from 1 to 90 grams. And so um, first things first, I would expect to see a strong relationship between urchin size and gonad size. As urchins are getting bigger, we'd expect their gonads to get bigger as well. So to determine where um, the cutoff was for reproductive maturity for these urchins, I found the, um, the cutoff at which urchins below that size no longer follow the trend of urchin size and gonad size. So there's no longer a relationship between urchin size and gonad size. Um, going back to the seasonality of urchin reproductive capacity, this is what we found. So on the x-axis is a timeline starting in summer 2022 and finishing in spring 2023. And on the y-axis is GSI. We see a peak of reproductive capacity in the fall, followed by a sharp decline into the winter, another smaller decline of GSI into the spring, and then an increase uh, into the summer. So urchins are... Um, getting more reproductive heading into their spawning season. Um, this pretty much follows what other studies have found in the past. Um, this figures from Lawrence et al, 1965. He has, um, or they have month on the x-axis and GSI on the y-axis as well. We see in both figures um, a peak in the fall, followed by a sharp decrease into the winter, another smaller decrease into the spring, and then we start to see that increase into the summer. Um, these results are also reflected in Geese et al. 1959 and Goner 1973. So it's pretty, this seasonal cycle of urchin reproduction is pretty consistent. Um, so this is the data for um, reproductive capacity and urchin size. So on the, y or the x axis is urchin weight, on the y axis is gonad weight, and we see a really strong linear relationship between urchin weight and gonad weight except for urchins that are smaller than about 3.1 grams. So once urchins get that small, they're no longer reproductive. Um, this is the same figure, except on the x-axis is test diameter. So instead of seeing a linear relationship, uh, we see a cubic relationship, because diameter is a measure of length, weight is a measure of volume. So we need to um, cube the test diameters to see that relationship. And um, same thing, same analysis, um, urchins smaller than about 1.8 centimeters are no longer reproductive. This uh, falls in line with Kenner and Lair's 1991. Um, they found the range of reproductive to maturity to be between 1.6 and 2.2 centimeters. Um, on their figure on the right, the x-axis is test diameter, just like mine. The y-axis is number of sea urchins. So the crosshatched bars are urchins that were mature. 
the empty bars were urchins that were immature. So you can see that you know, somewhere between 1.5 and 2 centimeters, um, we start to see urchins becoming reproductively mature. Um, Goner, at, Goner in 1972 did a similar analysis. Um, on the y-axis here is GSI, the x-axis is test diameter, except he found that urchins um, got to be reproductively mature a little bit, uh, at a little bit bigger size, between 2.5 and 3.5 centimeters. So just a little bit bigger um, than what I found and what Kenner and Lairs found in 1991. So um, for the rest of this study, I'm going to consider the cutoff to be about 2 centimeters. Obviously, there's some give and take, but um, about, at about 2 centimeters, urchins become reproductively mature. Um, it is also sort of interesting to note that um, Goner's study happened about 50 years ago. So um, we could be seeing a shift into urchins becoming um, reproductive smaller. That, uh, that study was also in the subtitle in the Monterey Bay. Um, now, why is this important? Well, in order to combat this transition from kelp forest to urchin barrens, we see um, urchin culling and trapping are two big ways to um, encourage areas to return back to kelp forests. So urchin culling is when divers go out and smash sea urchins. Um, another way of removing urchins is to trap them, bring them up to the surface, and then either kill them or harvest them for consumption. And so when we think about these urchin removal efforts, um, the seasonality of reproduction establishes a sort of timeline with which we might want to focus these efforts. We want to focus these efforts before, oops, before this um, or the decline in winter, because when urchin, uh, when urchin reproductive capacity goes down, that indicates that they've spawned. And so we want to focus our efforts maybe in the summer and the fall before they've had a chance to, to spawn. Um, second, this size cutoff for reproductive maturity is important for the implications of population data. When we do, um, when we do population assessments for urchins, if we consider each urchin that we count to have the same importance for the overall reproduction of the population, then we're probably going to overestimate the reproduction that's going on in a given population. Because about 25% of the urchins in the inner tidal are smaller than that two centimeter cutoff. And so we can't consider these urchins as effectively reproducing. So they can't be considered um, in the same way that larger urchins are. OK, moving on to my second research question. How do different environmental and biological factors affect intertidal urchin reproductive capacity on and around the Monterey Peninsula? I'm going to talk about five different predictor variables. We collected a few more, um, but I'm only going to present on these five um, today. And that those were coral and algae presence or absence in the urchin's stomach, fleshy algae and coral and algae coverage, where we collect the urchins from, urchin density, where we collected the urchins from, and wave exposure um, at each site. The response variable, again, will be urchin reproductive capacity, GSI, the same thing I've been talking about for my first question. Um, and first of all, I will run the analysis separate for each season because we saw such a dramatic seasonal pattern in reproductive capacity. It's important to run this analysis separate for each season. Um, to determine whether coral and algae presence or absence in the urchin's stomach affects reproduction, I ran a t-test or a, um, the non-parametric parametric, um, equivalent, depending on whether the assumptions were met for each given season. Um, and then for algae coverage, urchin density, and wave exposure, I ran linear regressions um, with um, my response variable being um, GSI. Again, same study sites as before, same four collection periods, um, 25 urchins per site per season. So 900 urchins were collected and analyzed um, in this study. At each site, I haphazardly laid five one meter quadrats each season. Um, I tried to encompass all the habitats within a given site um, and sort of disperse them randomly throughout the site. Within each quadrat, um, first I counted all the urchins to get urchin density data, and then I quantified the algal communities using percent coverage. So that is, with each group of algae, what percent of the quadrat was taken up. Um, was taken up. And so you can see that, for example, if we're counting seagrass in this quadrat, it's relatively simple. Um, there's one big chunk of seagrass, so we estimate, okay, what percent of the quadrat um, is taken up by the seagrass? But that can be a little bit more complex when we think about counting the coral and algae in this quadrat. Um, it's in a bunch of tiny little patches, and so it can be a bit difficult, um, a bit more difficult to estimate the percent cover. Um, so I counted all my groups of algae, and then I sorted them as either fleshy, so things like kelp, ulva, masiella, codium, um, generally things that are thought to be more palatable 
for urchins and coral and algae, which I talked about before, urchins tend to avoid. Um, it's sort of like eating chalk for urchins. Um, so those are the two groups of algae that I'll be talking about. Um, and the first thing that we see is seasonal variation in fleshy algae coverage. So on the x-axis is my timeline. On the y-axis is percent coverage of fleshy algae. And you can see that from the fall to the winter, um, there's a decline at most sites um, in fleshy algae coverage. And this represents an annual senescence of fleshy algae and then followed by a regrowth um, the following year. So sort of like how uh, leaves fall off of a tree and then regrow the next year. Same sort of thing going on with the fleshy algae in the intertidal. Um, we also see a lot of variability in coral and algae coverage. This is the same graph, but with coral and algae on the y-axis. And you can see there's quite a bit of variability um, from site to site, but we don't see the same um, seasonal decline from fall to winter like we do with fleshy algae. Um, the next set of figures that I'm going to present um, represent the algal community makeup of each site. And so the way to read these graphs is um, on the x-axis is a timeline, so the same timeline that I've been presenting. On the y-axis is the percent cover of the different groups. So the blue triangles are non-algae, things like bare rock, um, mussels, anemones, barnacles. Um, and then the pink squares are coral and algae. The green circles are fleshy algae. And then the red diamonds are crustose non-coral and algae. They're not coral and algae, um, but they are crust, so I can't really consider them fleshy algae, so things like uh, Petrocillus or Hildenbrandia. Um, so we have sites that look like Point Pinos. This is another aerial photo of Point Pinos um, that are fleshy algae dominated. You can see especially in the summer, the fall, and the winter, the dominant group of algae is fleshy algae, and they exhibit low urchin densities. Um, so on the x-axis is the timeline, on the y-axis is urchin density. And you can see that at Point Pinos, that thick blue line, um, we see low, relatively low urchin densities throughout the year. So this is a site that sort of resembles a kelp forest, right? Lots of fleshy algae, not very many urchins. Um, on the flip side of that, we have sites like Pescadero Point that have high coral and algae coverage throughout the year and have really high urchin densities. So at during most of our collection, um, collections, the urchin densities at Pescadero Point were more than 100 uh, per meter squared. So this is a site that resembles um, an urchin barren with lots of coral and algae and lots of urchins. However, like I mentioned earlier, that dichotomy between urchin barren and kelp forest doesn't really exist in the intertidal. We have sites like Point Lobos that have high coral and algae coverage throughout the year, um, but exhibit relatively low urchin densities compared to the other sites. On the flip side, we have sites like Carmel Point, um, and this is what I think is the most interesting, sites where we have high fleshy algae coverage, especially in the summer and the fall, and really high urchin densities throughout the year as well. Um, except for the fall, the urchin densities were between 100 and 200 per meter squared on average. So lots of fleshy algae and also lots of urchins. Now, we do see these trends from site to site, like I just talked about, but going back to Pescadero Point, all of these habitats can exist within a few meters of each other. You can see this picture was taken from Pescadero Point. There's lots of fleshy algae. I don't see very many urchins in this photo. However, just a few meters away, it looks like this. Um, with, I think on this transect that ran through the tide pool, we counted um, like uh, 12,000 urchins. So tons and tons of urchins, um, not very much fleshy algae, and that's just nearby to that other photo. Um, in the same way, we can have areas that look a lot like um, they have lots of fleshy algae at first glance, but if you zoom in in these cracks and crevices, um, all that purple is urchins, hundreds and hundreds of urchins. So all of these habitats can also exist on really low spatial scales. Again, like I mentioned, my response variable is GSI. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. The urchin on the left here has big, healthy yellow gonads, so this would be a high GSI urchin. The urchin on the right has, you can see the gonads are really small and shriveled, so this would represent a low GSI urchin. Um, from each urchin, like I mentioned, I also noted whether we found coral and algae in its stomach or not. Um, so the first thing we notice is low variability in GSI in the um, spring and the winter. So after urchins have spawned, pretty much GSI is uniformly low at all seasons. And since I'm trying to assess what might be driving variability, I'm going to focus my analysis on the summer and the fall when we see lots of variability um, 
in urchin reproductive capacity. Okay, so um, this is the first set of my results. On the x-axis is urchin density, on the y-axis is GSI, and on the left is summer, on the right is fall. Um, and we see no relationship between urchin density and GSI in the summer or the fall. Um, again, it's important to mention that we had quadrats of up to 500 urchins per meter squared. Next, we see a positive relationship between fleshy algae and GSI. On the x-axis is fleshy algae coverage, and so you can see quadrats that had more fleshy algae had urchins that were more reproductive in both the summer and the fall. Next, we see no relationship between coral and algae percent coverage and urchin GSI. So um, even in areas that had high coral and algae percent coverage, we see that the urchins there exhibit high reproductive capacities. And finally, um, urchins that were found with coral and algae in their stomach exhibited lower reproductive capacities. So the box plots on the right, or the box plot on the right of each figure is um, urchins that were found with coral and algae in their stomach, and on the left is urchins that were, with, were found without any coral and algae in their stomach. So urchins that didn't have coral and algae in their stomach um, were more likely to have a higher GSI. Now in order to consider what this all means, I'm gonna bring in the second part of my question, which is how does this compare what I just presented to what we see in the subtitle. So I'm gonna compare my data um, to subtitle data in the same area from Smith and Garcia 2021. Um, their data was collected in the summer, so I only used my summer data for this analysis to make sure that things lined up okay. And then I compared the strength of the linear relationships between GSI and each predictor variable um, using the significance of the relationship, the R-squared value, so the strength of the correlation, and the FX size, or the slope of the line. Um, these are the three predictors I'm going to use. Like I mentioned, urchin density, fleshy algae, and coral and algae, taken from Smith and Garcia for the subtitle and taken from this project. Um, for the inner title. These are the study sites from Smith and Garcia, so ranging on the, southern, um, on the southern coast of the Monterey Bay or the northern coast of the Monterey Peninsula, um, ranging sort of in a continuous line from breakwater up to Point Pinos. So well within the spatial context of where I collected my data, you can see um, my sites are on the right there and the red boxes um, where Smith and Garcia collected their data. Um, the first thing that we see in Smith and Garcia is a negative, excuse me, a negative correlation between urchin density and GSI. So in areas where there were more urchins, the urchins living in there were more likely to be less reproductive. Um, like I presented before, we see no relationship between urchin density and GSI. Again, another option, uh, another um, opportunity to point out that in the inner title, the urchins are way dense, we, way more dense. In Smith and Garcia, there were never more than 40 urchins per meter squared. Here we had urchins of up to 250 per meter squared. Next, in the, inner, in the subtitle, they saw a positive relationship between fleshy algae and GSI. More fleshy algae, healthier urchins, more reproductive urchins. Um, we see the same thing in the inner title, um, a positive relationship between fleshy algae and GSI. However, when we um, look deeper into this relationship, the effect size and the R squared were double that, in the, double in the subtitle compared to the inner title. So a much stronger relationship in the subtitle compared to the inner title. Finally, um, Smith and Garcia see a strong negative correlation between coral and algae percent coverage on the x-axis and GSI on the y-axis. So areas that had lots of coral and algae, the urchins there were less likely to be reproductive. And again, I saw no relationship between coral and algae and GSI in the inner title. So, to sum it all up, what does this all mean? First, inner title urchins live in densities far higher than the subtitle, but since we don't see a relationship between urchin density and GSI in the inner title, um, they still exhibit high reproductive capacities despite living in high densities. Next, subtitle urchins are largely eating what's growing around them. Um, in areas with lots of fleshy algae, those urchins are healthy. In areas with lots of coral and, uh, coral and algae, those urchins are not healthy, likely because they're eating that coral and algae, um, which we know urchins tend to avoid. Intertidal urchins are eating some fleshy algae growing around them. We saw a positive relationship between fleshy algae and um, GSI in the intertidal. However, because this relationship was not nearly as strong in the intertidal as it was in the subtitle, coupled with the fact that we see no relationship between coral and algae and GSI, 
even though when we found urchins that had coral and algae in their stomachs, they were less reproductive, right? So if the urchins living in areas of high coral and algae coverage were eating that um, coral and algae, we'd expect to see that negative correlation, but we don't. Um, so this indicates that intertidal urchins are likely getting food from an outside source. Um, one potential outside source for these intertidal urchins to get food would be drift algae. So drift algae is algae that is growing in the subtidal and then is ripped up by a wave or by an herbivore, floats to the surface, and then is eventually washed onto the intertidal. Um, so this would provide urchins in the intertidal with a continual source of food. This has been documented once for intertidal urchins living in Chile. Um, Rodriguez in 2003 has uh, test diameter, so urchin size, on the x-axis and the weight of the gonads on the y-axis. The top two lines are from areas with high drift algae availability. The bottom line is from an area with low drift algae, algae availability. Um, so the easiest way to, to explain this figure is if you look at just the big urchins, they're a lot, they have a lot bigger gonads if they come from areas of high drift algae availability compared to the um, urchins that came from low drift algae availability. So this indicates that drift algae was important for urchins living in the intertidal in Chile. So I thought, okay, how do I, um, how do I quantify how much drift algae might be available at a site? And my first thought was to quantify wave exposure um, because I thought bigger waves, um, more drift algae, right? More, more algae being washed ashore. Um, the closest wave data available for the Monterey Peninsula is at the uh, Monterey Outer Buoy, but that's not high, high enough resolution to sort between um, from site to site for me. So I use the Coastal Data and Information Program Monitoring and Prediction System, otherwise known as CDIP, um, and they use uh, Outer Buoy data to model nearshore events. Um, so we, they have data for each of my sites. Um, it's less reliable for individual events, but um, so individual wave events, it's less reliable, but I'm more concerned with how big have the waves been prior to when I collected the urchins, right? So if the waves were really big in the month prior to when I collected the urchins, I'd expect to see more drift algae. So I averaged the daily max wave height in the month prior to my collections at each site. Um, and here is what I found, um, wave height on the y-axis, timeline on the x-axis. Um, and you can see that the January storms had a profound effect on the waves, especially at the sites that were outside the bay. You can see the three sites that were protected by the peninsula didn't really see the effect of those storms um, as much. So my next step is to, uh, to compare this data to GSI to see if there was an effect, and I didn't see one. So I saw um, no effect of wave height and GSI in summer or fall. However, wave height's not the only determining factor for drift algae availability. We also know that bottom topography, substrate type, and the proximity to kelp forests are also important in determining how much drift algae might be at a site. Um, so what I really needed to do was just quantify how much drift algae is at each of my sites. So I went back to my nine sites, and I laid two 100 to 400 meters squared quadrats, so uh, big, big boxes where we weighed all of the fleshy drift algae at each site to quantify how much um, was there, and then I classified each of my sites as low, medium, or high drift algae availability sites, um, similar to what Rodriguez did um, in his paper uh, from Chile. And what we see is that in areas with more drift algae availability, we see urchins that are more reproductive. So on the x-axis for both summer and fall is drift algae availability, low, medium, or high. On the y-axis is GSI, and you can see that as we get more drift algae at a site, the urchins are more likely to be um, to exhibit higher GSIs. So, okay, to summarize all of um, this data, we see that intertidal urchin populations are much more dense than subtidal populations. The subtidal populations rely more on algae growing around them. We see we see saw really strong relationships between coralline and fleshy algae and GSI in the uh, subtidal. Um, Intertidal urchin populations most likely rely more on drift algae. Um, this means that the intertidal supports dense populations of highly reproductive sea urchins that, are, um, that have drift algae delivered to them throughout the year. So that means that even areas that look like urchin barrens, they have high coral and algae coverage and lots of urchins, um, these urchins can still be reproductive because drift algae is continuously deposited at that site. <clears throat> 
But all the data that I've presented so far is, first of all, per capita, right? So I've considered how much does each factor affect each urchin's reproduction. Additionally, I've normalized by how big each urchin was, because GSI divides the weight of the gonad by the size of the urchin. And this is all necessary to get at what might be affecting the reproduction, but in the end, what we're interested in is how much reproduction is happening in the inner tidal, because we're curious whether the inner tidal is supplying subtidal urchin barons with a continuous population of urchins, and we need to consider the fact we need to consider how many urchins there are in the inner tidal, how big they are, and how much um, in total the population is reproducing. So next what I did is I took size frequency data, so how, um, what proportion of the urchin population is each size. So for example, about 20% of urchins are between one and two centimeters in the inner tidal. I multiplied that data by our urchin density data to get how many urchins of each size there were in each quadrat. And then I multiplied that data by size-specific gonad weights. So like, I've, like I talked about earlier, urchins smaller than two centimeters essentially have no gonads. So zero for them. And then um, as, we get, as urchins get bigger, their gonads weigh more. So I multiplied how many urchins of each size by how, many, how much their gonads weighed to get data on how much gonad was present in each quadrat. So how many grams of gonad was present in each quadrat. I did this for my inner tidal sites as well as the subtitle data from Smith and Garcia. First thing um, that we see is there's about 10 grams of gonad on average per meter squared in the subtitle compared to what we see in the inner tidal, which is far more um, gonad per meter squared. Um, so overall, intertidal urchins exhibit a higher reproductive output um, per unit area compared to the subtital, especially at Cannery Row, Pescadero Point, and Carmel Point. These three sites are really, really high-density urchin sites, so there are enough urchins to over overcome the fact that the urchins in the intertidal might be smaller or might um, each be reproducing less. Okay. Um, to summarize everything that I've talked about today, seasonality of urchin spawning has important implications for the timing of urchin removals and culls. We want to remove um, and or kill urchins prior to their winter spawning period. The size at reproductive maturity is integral in assessing the reproduc reproductive outputs of urchin populations. We need to consider that urchins smaller than two centimeters are not reproducing in the same way that urchins bigger than two centimeters are. Intertidal urchins are far more dense than subtidal populations. I've gone over that a lot. Um, intertidal urchins feed on fleshy algae growing around them, but likely depend on drift algae for a large portion of their diet. So when algae is washed onto the intertidal, urchins are likely um, using that and, or eating that um, as, part, as, a, as a major part of their diet. And finally, intertidal urchin reproductive output is much higher than subtidal urchin reproductive output per unit area. So when we think about these management efforts, when we think about urchin culls and urchin removals, um, it's important to consider intertidal urchin populations for these kelp restoration efforts to mac maximize their efficacy. Because if urchins in the intertidal are reproducing, their offspring are ending up in subtidal barrens. No matter how many urchins we kill from barrens, if urchins are coming from the intertidal, um, then these efforts won't be as successful as they can be if we include intertidal areas. And that's all I have today. Um, Thank you to the funding sources. This was a project funded by um, California Sea Grant and the California Ocean Protection Council's Kelp Restoration Program. And um, I also got some supplemental funding from Moss Landing and from um, the Coast Grant. Um, thank you to my thesis committee. Where's Allison? Hi, Allison. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful for everything um, that you've done for me. I can't remember how many times I've texted you at 11 o'clock at night um, and you've responded. Maybe even at 2 a.m. you've responded. <laughs> um, and the Thanksgiving dinner that Allison mentioned was bought by Allison. And she's bought me so many dinners over the last three years. <laughs> so I appreciate that so much. Um, Amanda, any time I felt sad about science, you brought me right back up. Um, I, I bet a lot of people in this room can say the same thing about you. And I appreciate that so much. Um, Tom. I found this sexy picture of you <laughs> from, <laughs> from uh, um, I think, from grad school. 
Um, but you, um, <laughs> you're one of my favorite teachers I've had. Um, and so I've appreciated so much all the feedback and everything you've taught me. Um, to the Hopped Lab um, field and lab team, there's a long list of them. Christian dissected more urchins than I did for this project. Um, so I appreciate him so much. I'm so proud of you, Christian. Um, Paige and Emily also contributed a lot to this work. Paige and Emily are doing great things in grad school now. Um, Liz is a PhD student at Maine. She's the one cutting the turkey on Thanksgiving. Um, there's a long list of people um, that have helped with this project, um, and I am just a small portion of it. So I'm very grateful to these people. Um, and also to my friends and family at um, Moss Landing. I guess mostly Jack, right? It's ev 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 <laughs> I, think, I think seven of these six pictures have Jack in them, and the one of me and Aaron Rodgers, Jack took. Um, so <laughs> no, I appreciate everybody, all my friends. Um, I see people from the climbing gym, who I appreciate so much. My communities at Monterey Bay Whale Watch showed out today. I appreciate that. Um, Rick and Gerard, my very first friends from Monterey, we rode um, every single morning for the first six months I lived here. I would bike from East Campus to the wharf, row with Rick and Gerard, and then bike back. And that was my day. Um, and I appreciate you guys so much. Um, I've had so much fun living here. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks to everybody. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. <laughs> and I'm happy to take any questions. Do you think there's any like density dependent factors that influence the urchins? Like, does there get to a critical point where like they can't all feed themselves? I mean, you said there was 12,000 at one point. Yeah. Um, from what we've seen in the intertidal, no, because the urchins that were living in um, densities of 500 per meter squared were just as healthy as those living in 30 per meter squared. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy how healthy these urchins can be. I think it's important to note that. Overall, the urchins in the inner tidal are a little bit smaller than those in the subtitle. So that difference in density, like between 30 per meter squared in the subtitle and 300 in the inner tidal, is maybe not that as big as it seems like, um, just based on the data alone. But I think still, since um, we have this drift algae, it definitely allows the urchins to live in higher densities than otherwise. Yeah, no worries. Isaac, super cool. I really like all the different aspects of your thesis. It was really interesting. Thanks. I was trying to think about the last point uh, where you sort of integrated, right? Sort of the, the total reproductive output per um, you know, grams of gonads yeah. per yeah, meter this. square. Yeah. And I was sort of thinking, you know, the inner tidal is generally a fairly narrow strip yeah. of the yeah. coastline. And yeah. So if you extend it all the way offshore to like all the available habitat at a right. site, do you yeah. think there would still be more reproduction happening in the inner tidal or more? in the subtitle at these sites? I think making that comparison is, uh, I, 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 Allison asked me to, to run that data this week, and I said, no, I don't have time. She told me to ask you that question. <laughs> um, she told me to ask you that question, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I mean, I think that it's like, um, it's so hard to say with how patchy both the inner title and the subtitle is. Like, we could compare each of my sites to the subtitle that's right next door and do that comparison and compare how big the areas are. But then when you think about the entire Monterey Peninsula, you know how much habitable area is there for urchins compared to the subtitle, I think that comparison is very, very valuable um, and very, very difficult. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But we see, you know, it's about seven times higher than the um, in the inner title compared to the subtitle. So there would have to be a lot more habitat in the subtitle. Sorry, I don't have a straightforward answer. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? <laughs> 
Hi, Isaac. Um, I just have more of like a like broad kind of question, but kind of based on your research, mm -hmm. what like management practices do you suggest? Um, uh, to start doing what we're doing in the subtitle in the inner title. So going out and removing urchins from the inner title. Um, it would be cool to remove urchins from the inner title in an area and see how that affected nearby barons, um, I think would be a good start. Um, I'd also love to see, like all my data is pretty observational in the sense that we're looking at you know, the quadrat where we collected the urchins from. It would be cool to manipulate whether urchins were allowed to eat drift algae or not by setting up some sort of cages in the field. Um, I think it would also be cool to, like I looked at correlations in the one meter squared where we found those urchins. So I would like to see how those correlations change like how, as you quantify the algae further away from where you get the urchins. Because um, I think that data would be really cool as well. I had a question about the Smith and Garcia data that yeah. you used when yeah. you were doing the comparison. Mm -hmm. So when you showed the Smith and Garcia sites, you mm -hmm. showed how they overlapped really nicely with your sites that were on the inside of the peninsula. Yeah. Yeah. When you did the comparison to your data, did you only use the sites of yours that were closest to those, or did you use all of your sites? I used all of my sites, okay. but I will show you, let's see, I added somewhere something kind of cool about inside versus outside the bay. Okay, so um, this is in the summer and the fall the relationship between fleshy algae and GSI at inside and outside the bay sites. So especially in the fall, you can see that urchins inside the bay likely depend a lot more on fleshy algae compared to urchins outside the bay. Um, and so to get at your point, how does this affect the comparison between Smith and Garcia? Um, it affects how we view the fleshy algae data, um, but we still, um, when I ran the inside and outside the bay comparisons for coral and algae coverage, uh, we saw no difference. And so still, we aren't seeing a negative correlation between coral and algae and urchin GSI in um, the inner tidal, no matter whether those urchins are inside or outside the bay. Thank you. Are there some questions on Zoom? Okay, so there's one question on Zoom. Um, from Malin, who's one of the students in marine ecology. Yep. <laughs> uh, he said, Isaac, you mentioned that some sea urchins were found to be consuming mussel shells. Was yeah. this one of the factors you compared to GSI, or were there too few urchins eating shells for it to be analyzed? Too few urchins. It was just at Hopkins, um, where, if you're familiar with Hopkins, it's been slowly filling with more and more mussels over the past um, couple of years. And the urchins that we saw with mussel shells in their stomach were like, living inside the mussel beds. There was no algae around, so um, I guess they just resorted to eating mussels. But those urchins were very, very, had very, very low GSIs, which makes sense if you're eating mussel shells. <laughs> they were also you ain't going to be reproducing. They were also eating bissel threads at some And bissel threads, yeah. that's true, right, yeah. Any other questions for Isaac? Okay. Cool, thank you, everybody. Woo!